We'll get started. We've got a very interesting talk. Uh, certainly, uh, you'll get a lot more information uh, from our uh, guest speaker here this morning. And uh, lots of time for questions. I think the booths will remain open. Uh, good information. I think I learned a lot from uh, uh, the nutrition and how you can change what you eat every day. Uh, that uh, is certainly very important in health. And, uh, you know, with that, I'll uh, basically uh, get the uh, our talk started, uh, Dr. Milner, please. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. So uh, actually today uh, uh, we're going to sort of give you a little brief introduction to the South Asian Heart Center uh, and then sort of um, discuss the science behind the recommendation. So we are not going to, we're going to talk a little bit of what we do, uh, why we do what we do but we're mainly going to talk about how is it that we are addressing the epidemic of cardiovascular disease in this population of risk. So um, uh, this actually sort of uh, some disclosures. Uh, uh, this is where I went to medical school, but um, according to new regulations, I need to tell you that uh, uh, I am actually um, uh, have received some f uh, consulting fees from uh, Quest Diagnostics and Boston Scientific World. Um, I'm, I'm, de I'm dealing with uh, Boston Scientific with uh, access to healthcare for uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, groups such as women and, uh, uh, and other minorities. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about South Asian heart disease. Um, it is very common where people tell me, yeah, Southeast Asia. So there's a very big difference. We did fight a war in Southeast Asia. We never have fought a war in South Asia. Um, that is. Um, South Asia means the Indian subcontinent, and Southeast Asia, talks. we're talking about Cambodia and uh, Vietnam. So we're talking about individuals from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. Uh, that's about 20, over 20% 20 of the world's population, and there are about 3.8 million South Asians uh, in the USA, over half a million uh, in the Bay Area. Now, this population actually uh, holds 60% of the global burden of coronary artery disease. Uh, and by 2030, it will hold 50% of the world's population uh, for diabetes. So we're dealing with a big epidemic of coronary artery disease and diabetes. So um, we're seeing that. That's why we, are, we created the South Asian Heart Center at El Camino Hospital. Um, at, um, what we were seeing in, in the uh, early um, uh, 2000s uh, was that we were seeing young South Asian engineers, 44 year old, typical South Asian engineers, showing up in the uh, El Camino emergency room with a heart attack without the typical risk factors for coronary artery disease. And those days uh, were uh, very <coughs> ignorant. So we actually um, thought that it was because South Asians had smaller coronary arteries because we took them to the cath lab, did coronary angiograms, and we would actually find that they had. Uh, sort of thin, diabetic-looking uh, arteries. So uh, it's very common to sort of uh, uh, make, them, uh, make a misdiagnosis. So as we uh, learn more about the epidemic, we learn that South Asians do not have smaller arteries than the rest of humanity, but they have more diffuse arteriosclerosis that then gives us the impression in the cath lab that they actually have um, a smaller coronary arteries. So um, 25 years, what's happening is in this epidemic, we're seeing that they, the disease starts at a younger age. So 25% of heart attacks occur below the age of 40. We have seen a 24-year-old uh, uh, young man have a heart attack at El Camino Hospital. I was just in Patiala, and I was talking to the cardiologist over there, and they have seen 90-year-olds uh, with uh, coronary artery events and heart attacks. So, uh, India is actually in the middle of a big epidemic of coronary artery disease. Uh, the disease tends to be more aggressive. So for this being in the same hospital, same age, match, uh, South Asian versus a non-South Asian in the UK, um, they actually, the mortality rate is two times that of the non-South Asian uh, for uh, a heart attack. So this is actually what we're dealing with uh, presently. 
Now the question is, what is it? Because actually, this is a, the most common question that we get is, what uh, you know? What is the reason for uh, the increased uh, coronary artery disease? So, uh, is it fate, chance, uh, or choice? And there are the conditions that are common uh, in uh, in or sort of human, uh, humanity, such as hypertension, diabetes, and coronary artery disease, and cancer tend not to be single gene disorders. So we cannot say, gee, it's fate. You have the gene, you're going to get it. Um, it tends to, they tend to be sort of polygenic, multiple genes, and definitely behavioral, uh, such that uh, the, the behavior can add and subtract 12 years to the incidence, to your incidence to a, a cardiovascular event. So in the non-South Asian population, morbid obesity, Someone with a BMI of 40 or more will have a heart attack 12 years younger than someone who's not morbidly obese. Uh, and that actually the same genes, everything is just sort of different, different uh, behavior. So we have to conclude that there are some genetic predispositions, there are some metabolic disorders that have, may have a genetic basis plus a behavioral basis, and that these actually are definitely susceptible to changes in lifestyle. And, and I'll answer your question in a second, and I'll give you an example. When you look at, Jap uh, at Japanese, Japanese in Japan tend to have half the incidence of heart attack than the uh, a typical uh, Western uh, extracted American citizen. When that Japanese moves to Hawaii, the incidence of a heart, a heart attack in that Japanese doubles. By the moment that he gets on a plane and lands in California, in San Francisco, his incidence of heart attack equals that of non-Japanese. And the only thing has happened, there's been no genetic change, he just has moved from one place to another place. And the lifestyle has changed. Same is true with familial hypercholesterolemia, where we're talking about maybe one gene, one disease. In, this, in the USA, you see heart attacks at 20 in that population. Same genetic defect in China, you see the heart attacks at 40. And the difference is the environment and the behavior on the diet. You had a question? So, given what you just said, uh -huh. it would seem like lifestyle and uh, habits have a much greater role to play in the environment than genetics. Is that true? Well, you know, you have to have a genetic predisposition for anything, including what we're, I mean, for me to say the words I have, I'm saying, there is a genetic predisposition. But the fact is that. Um, there is a significant, you know, significant uh, data that suggests that these diseases like hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, and cancer tend to have significant behavioral uh, etiologic factors. Would That's you say majority? Well, yes. I'm trying to understand majority of it has to do with lifestyle. Smaller percentage has to do with genetic. Of course, it plays a role, but it's a smaller percentage. That is correct. Okay. So, and, and the thing is, and actually after, at the end of this talk, that the take home message is, uh, the thing you have to remember is 12 years. You can add or subtract 12 years to your longevity on the way, on, depending on how you live. So, your, what is here, what is playing here is 12 years of longevity and many more years of quality of life. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the beautiful things about longevity is that you can't, you know, you can't sort of, uh, you cannot make, you know, you cannot make a statistical mistake. You're alive or you're dead. There's nothing in the way, you know, there's no, no sort of middle, uh, middle ground there. And that's what we're talking, uh, talking about here. So, um, what the South Asian, the, how the South Asian sort of has dealt with this sort of epidemic is that we have developed an outreach program, like today, and we have then sort of uh, deployed uh, an aim to prevent uh, a program where we assess for risk factors, uh, we intervene with education, and then we continue that intervention through a, for a year through heart health uh, coaching. Um, and this has also given us an opportunity to do research. And we are now sort of starting to publish some of our data. We have screened about 4,500 uh, individuals. So uh, this is sort of our aim to prevent. So this advanced screening, lifestyle counseling, and uh, sort of heart health coaching. Now this is a very uh, poor slide. Uh, 
Um, and uh, but actually now I can sort of see it. This is when you go to see the doctor. So when, when you see your regular physician, you actually get a blood pressure. Uh, if you're lucky, they'll measure your uh, uh, waist uh, uh, circumference. We measure BMI by measuring your height. Uh, Medicare wants uh, every uh, revisit now to include a height and a weight so that we can calculate the BMI. And doctors are getting paid uh, uh, by, by, by our government to do that, along with other uh, other things, <laughs> believe it or not. And we get a total lipid panel. We get a cholesterol level, LDL, which is thought to be the bad cholesterol, HDL, the good cholesterol, triglycerides, and uh, blood sugar. But actually, that is actually very self-limiting. It doesn't tell us the whole picture. And uh, Achish has been working beautifully with the iceberg. Uh, he saw that movie, you know, that talks about hitting an iceberg on a ship. Uh, so uh, he, uh, we have actually uh, created this, sort of this iceberg cartoon, and this is what we get you at the South Asian Heart Center. We get you advanced screening where we actually look at the HDL cholesterol and we identify the particles because cholesterol does not travel by itself in the circulation. There is no such thing as a particle of cholesterol traveling in the circulation like blood sugar. Blood sugar travels in the circulation. Cholesterol is attached to particles and is carried by particles. So the typical traditional guideline just measures cholesterol levels. We actually look at the particles for the LDL cholesterol, for the HDL cholesterol. We look for other genetic uh, predisposing factors such as alpha little a. We pay uh, close attention to family history of diabetes and coronary artery disease. And then we also look at inflammation. We look at insulin, insulin resistance and we can then identify individuals who are also at increased risk of diabetes. So diabetes and coronary artery disease, particularly in this population, are first causes. So in the general population, 20% of people with cardiovascular disease, 20% of people who have had a heart attack will develop diabetes. In this population, probably that number uh, is uh, um, much higher. And then lastly, uh, and it's sort of difficult to see here, we actually pay a lot of attention to lifestyle because there are significant lifestyle differences between South Asians and uh, the rest uh, and the rest of the population. So this is actually how we intervene. So we have aim to prevent, to uh, uh, identify and help you manage the uh, factors uh, for uh, coronary artery disease. And to enroll, you actually are, you can enroll right here to enter sort of the aim, aim to prevent uh, program. But what we then do is we apply for therapy. And this actually is our therapy. It's, we call it MEDS for meditation, exercise, diet, and sleep. So um, I tend to be sort of boring, so before you fall asleep, meditation is tw 20 minutes twice a day of transcendental meditation. And my goal here today is to show you the science behind this exercise. <clears throat> uh, about at least 150 minutes uh, per week. And I think that that is sort of Mickey Mouse recommendation. Uh, if you eat, you should be physically active. Um, and uh, particularly, if you want to avoid the nursing home and the wheelchair, you have to really pay attention to this. Uh, diet, very simple. People come from different cultures. India has multiple different uh, uh, nutritional dietary uh, uh, traditions. Uh, people in the north eat different than people in the south. Um, and uh, but take home message is: two fistful of vegetables, one fist of fruit, twelve nuts daily, uh, and uh, no soda. You know, soda is really poisonous. So that's really you know that's it. Where there are very few notes in the South Asian Heart Center recommendations, and there are only two. Don't smoke, don't drink soda. That's it. Uh, and, uh, and then sleep. Uh, uh, seven to eight hours of sleep. You know, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, in, in chapter six, it says, yoga is, he, is not for he who does not sleep or sleep too much. And I'll show you some data on, on that exact sort of, uh, sort of recomm a recommendation for our official to, to argue. Um, so, uh, we provide you with your own free heart health coach, and you get your own heart health coach for about a year. And this heart health coach gently 
monitors and motivates you to sort of apply the MET program. And uh, you get interactions monthly, quarterly, and you get all these sort of touch points. It's voluntary. Uh, you can also say, just leave me alone. I, I decided that I want to be uh, FAT and you know, watch, P, uh, watch TV and eat pizza. But you know, we will encourage you to sort of leave those habits if you want. Uh, we find your passion uh, when we help you discover uh, your solutions. So we also work with your primary care physician. We mentioned that we don't uh, practice medicine at the South Asian Heart Center. So our participants are known as participants. They are not known uh, as patients. Uh, and uh, so you come in, uh, you get screened, and then we report to your primary care physician uh, or cardiologist. If you don't have uh, a physician, we help you find one who actually has demonstrated interest in participating with us and partnering with us to help you uh, decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes. And even though we're talking about the, you know, the bad things, we're talking about heart disease and diabetes, ultimately, if you follow the MEDS program, you're going to feel great. So you don't have to wait, oh, I'm trying to avoid a heart attack in 20 years, you'll feel great tomorrow. And that's really, I think, uh, uh, you know, that actually is the, you know, the greatest uh, you know, motivator. So once you get addicted to, you know, to meds, you know, you're really sort of, uh, you, you really go for it because you, you enjoy it. Uh, it makes you feel really good. So aim to prevent actually uh, is, uh, is at no cost to you is for the most part. Uh, it is actually uh, the South Asian Heart Center has uh, been sponsored by the El Camino Hospital and it's also sponsored by the South Asian community. Uh, uh, through, uh, through donations and grants. So coming through our system uh, is of no cost to you. Uh, the, uh, the intervention is all covered by the center. Uh, and the management is also all covered. The heart health coaching is actually all covered by the center. There is some blood work that has to be done that is not done by us, it's done by a lab. And they send you a bill or you can prepay and get a significant discount if you sort of prepay. Um, the, the thing is that you know you get a test that would be about eight hundred dollars, and you get it for like eighty, fifty bucks or something like that. So I have, you know, I think it's the best deal in town. Uh, I mean, it's uh, you know just taking your car to your car dealer just to have an oil change is, is more expensive than enrolling at the uh, at the uh, uh, heart center. Uh, you also have access to uh, advanced screening with a heart scan. Uh, and uh, you know we always like to get a good deal, so we have negotiated with the hospital, and you can get a 400 test for a hundred test for a hundred bucks. Uh, um, so a heart scan that usually would cost you between 400 and 800 dollars. Looking for co asymptomatic coronary arterial sclerosis, you can get that for a hundred dollars at El Camino Hospital from a voucher we can give you at the Salvation Heart Center. So that way you don't have to guess. So, you know, I'm always asked, you know, why, why are South Asians at higher risk? Well, it is not because they have smaller coronary arteries. Uh, there's actually an excess burden of conventional risk factors, and those risk factors, which are no different than in other populations, it's not that South Asians have something different than everyone else, is that those, early, those risk factors occur at an early age, at an earlier age. Uh, there are lifestyle factors. So, uh, if the uh, Joshi um, uh, 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 actually published a paper looking at the interheart inter -heart data. And when you're looking at act, you know, exercise, only 6.1% uh, of South Asians actually uh, exercise daily, while 26% of the population do some physical activity uh, every day of the other non-South Asian population. The consumption of fruits and vegetables is really amazing. You have a, 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 a vegetarian-based culture where only 26% of the population is a, is a vegetable or a fruit every day versus 45% in other populations. So the, the difference is that there's a grain-based vegetarian diet versus a green-based vegetarian diet. And this diet, the, the modern diet of India, is not the traditional diet of India. So if you read, the, you know, if you read Ayurveda, if you look at the traditional uh, uh, diet of India, you know, potatoes did not exist in India before Christopher Columbus. Uh, so there were no samosas before Christopher Columbus. And, uh, or peppers, for that matter. Because they all came from, from Peru and South America. 
And then there are also some uh, genetic uh, predispositions, uh, such as higher levels of LP little a, which increases your risk of car cardiovascular disease, particularly if you have low levels of, uh, of good cholesterol. So this is actually, this is where our office is, uh, on the second floor here. Uh, and uh, uh, you're always, you know, you're welcome to sort of sign up and sort of come and visit. Uh, so this is actually your mission statement. So this is, uh, come to, this is what we're trying to sort of provide. And it's to reduce the high incidence of heart disease and diabetes in the South Asian population. And we try to do that through a culturally appropriate program that raises awareness through education, <coughs> evaluates risk with advanced screening, and facilitates lifestyle changes with heart health coaching. So that is actually what you're sort of buying in. Uh, and uh, the side effect of doing this is actually you'll feel great, and you may even get a license, you never know. So uh, what we're going to do now uh, is to sort of look, go over the signs behind our TLC program. Our TLC program or therapeutic lifestyle changes is actually what I can consider uh, to be your sort of uh, owner's manual uh, to uh, successful uh, aging and, and longevity. Uh, we were born without a book. We have tried to create those sort of books, uh, you know, throughout uh, throughout human uh, human history, uh, where we have been given sort of rules on how to live. Uh, you know, it was not a good idea to eat pork, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago. You can get trichinosis and die uh, from all, on, undercooked uh, with no thermometers to see the food was, you know, ready and stuff. So, I mean, all those things have, you know, humanity has sort of learned, you know, what foods are poisonous and not. Uh, but now we can also use science to sort of help us uh, uh, better understand. Uh, and that's what my, my goal here today would be. So, our uh, therapeutic lifestyle changes deal with activity, exercise as medicine, diet, and we'll be talking about the diner versus the dinner. When we, uh, you know, when, uh, when we talk about diet, most of the time we're talking about what is in front of us, and we rarely ever pay attention to the person who is sitting in front of the plate. And the fact is that how do you digest, how do you digest your food, how much exercise you have done that day, how well you have slept that day, uh, all play a role on how you di digest that food. And you all know this from your normal life. I mean, everybody knows this, that you've been sitting around all day watching TV, you're not going to digest if you have been playing soccer and coming back, you know, really invigorated and, have, and sit down and have a nice meal. And you'll sleep better too if you have exercise and all that. And then also rest. We'll talk about the benefits of sleep and we also talk about rest while you're awake. And that is actually what we call uh, uh, meditation. And we'll go over the different forms of meditation and the science behind, uh, particularly one of them that has been incorporated in the South Asian Heart Center. Now, our curriculum uh, is based on this study that was published in 1980. And this was published uh, after 25 years of study. So in Alameda County, 7,000 subjects were followed for 25 years. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the investigators <coughs> survived those 25 years. They themselves uh, uh, experienced successful aging and were able to write their paper. Uh, but uh, what uh, they did is they actually followed these 7,000 individuals for factors associated with survival for 25 years and successful aging. And successful aging was defined as the capacity to live in an autonomous way. That is, live by yourself, your home, take care of yourself. And you think about it, as we age, that is our biggest danger, loss of freedom. That's what disease really ultimately leads to, loss of being able to take care of yourself, dress yourself. And the enemy, I mean, I think that the dreaded thing is to end up in a wheelchair, in a nursing home, because you cannot take care uh, of yourself. So um, these were the seven factors. Uh, they are adequate sleep, seven to eight hours per night, regular vigorous activity, maintaining a recommended weight, no smoking, non or moderate alcohol consumption. Moderate alcohol, uh, moderate alcohol consumption was defined here no more than five drinks <laughs> per day. Uh, even <laughs> breakfast days, no six pack. You make it to the six pack, you're done. Uh, and, uh, and eating meals regularly, not snacking. I don't, you know, it's good for a cow, but not good for a human. Be sure all day long. So, do, yeah. do you recommend no snacking at all? In other words, people have breakfast, lunch, dinner because uh, 
you know, at least personal experience, I've found that if I do that, even if I've had a great breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I still feel hungry, especially if you have an active lifestyle. Yeah, so actually, you know, uh, to answer your question, and I commend you, you don't look at AT, so you may be doing something right. Um, but the, the thing is, this, what, what we mean by that is, it doesn't have to be three meals, but it doesn't, in snacking is different than having, uh, if you sit down and you have a meal, it's different than if you are eating a cheese candy here and having a potato chip there, and you don't never have a chance to sit down and have a meal. So you can actually have four meals. And in, you know, in Spain, the fourth meal would be a merienda, where at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you sit down uh, and have another mini meal before you have your 10 o'clock meal at night. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, so that, you know, that is still... I understand. That's what we're talking about. We're, we're right. not, what we are talking about is not having any meal and then just eating all day long. And actually, that is very common today in today's workplace, where that's what actually people are... Are doing. Now, the data that come, you know, remember we talked about the 12 years? Well, here is 11 years, but still close to 12. So if you're a 45 year old man and you have fewer than three habits or three or fewer of those habits, you were expected in 1980 to live to 67. If you uh, had four to five habits, you were expected to live to 73. Six to seven habits, you were expected to live to the age of 78. And the difference between the two is 11 years. Question? Yeah. It says regular vigorous activity, 3,000 yes. calories per gram per, per kg per day. Yes. So, so in physical, extra physical activity. Yeah, so for someone who is 100 kilograms, let's uh -huh. say, 100 kilograms times 3,000 calories. That would be 300 calories a day, extra. Or extra. Well, you see what happens is that a kilocalorie is a calorie with a big C. Okay, so this is a small C. So uh, it's just, uh, you know, what is a calorie with a C and what is a, a, you know, a calorie with a small C? Uh, and we're talking okay. about, you know, us, you know, big Cs. But uh, that's how they presented the data and how, you know, I presented the data but, to you. So it's really... But then it's too little, Dr. Malin. I mean, it's 300, 300 calories, calories of, 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 uh, of exercise per day. Oh, okay. Of exercise per day, not burning 300 calories per day because you burn 1,200. You know, you burn about 2,000 calories per day. Uh, but if you actually uh, uh, multiply that by seven, that is actually 2,100 calories extra per day. And actually, uh, uh, there was a Harvard study uh, looking at uh, at exercise in 16,000 Harvard graduates. I showed that. Uh, uh, doing 2,000 calories per week uh, mm. actually enhances, enhances your longevity at the age of 74 by about 49%. So it's all, you know, it all matches. Uh, uh, matches that. Uh, and the thing is, you know, it's very easy to eat 300 calories like a candy bar. And it's not that easy to burn 300 calories. I mean, you need to do a significant jogging for 30 minutes, you know, jog three miles. To burn 210 and 10 calories, so uh, you know, just put the, putting that into perspective. I tell I tell my patients that it's actually easier uh, to gain weight than to lose weight, and that's actually uh, that's a bummer, but that's the way it goes. Well, bummer in this kind of land of milk and honey. Uh, not bad if you're living in the middle of the desert. Go ahead. <laughs> Can you explain that in layman's terms, in terms of activity, how many minutes per day, or how many? minutes or hours per week. So we'll get to that. Actually, I'll show you a little bit more data. This is actually where our curriculum comes from. So what we'll do now is we'll talk about, we will be talking about sleep, we'll be talking about exercise, we'll be talking about things you put in your mouth, like meals, breakfast, um, and uh, we'll be talking about medication, which is not part of that stuff. So uh, this is actually, as promised, talking about exercise and medication. Um, and uh, we'll talk about where was the first research study done showing the benefits of exercise. Uh, and then uh, we'll sort of see what the benefits of exercise are. So um, I already sort of uh, defined sort of successful aging for you. 
but I think that it's really important for you to realize what are the factors that explain longevity. Uh, and uh, there are sort of uh, uh, longevity genes uh, in most uh, species. Uh, the Drosophila melanogaster and us, we actually, in chromosome 4, we share, we share some of those genes. Uh, but you know, the genetic, the genes can only account for a quarter of your longevity. Uh, and the rest is sort of, uh, you know, how you live. And I told you, you know, for example, this, mo this morning I gave the example that 2,000 years ago, humans lived 20 years. Average life expectancy was 20 years was an old person. Now it's 78. The genes haven't changed. But in the meantime, we discovered refrigeration. More importantly, sewers were, you know, developed, and vaccination. So those three things explain, not the better doctors or anything like that, you know, it's really, all of that explains most of the longevity has been source, refrigeration, and vaccination. So, you know, in the old days, people were, you know, hey, come over for dinner and do that tomorrow. So that actually has sort of significantly uh, changed. Now, coronary artery disease uh, and heart attack is actually, as we discussed, it's a multifactorial process. There are multiple risk factors, and there are all additive. And this is actually a, a slide from the Interheart trial looking at 15,000 people uh, with a heart premature heart attack. And you see that if you smoke, your risk of a heart attack goes up threefold. Uh, if you have diabetes, uh, two and a half. So smoking is really bad for you. Uh, hypertension, two times. Bad cholesterol, high LDL, low HDL, threefold. <coughs> if you combine smoking, diabetes, and hypertension, it goes up. 13 times. If you combine all of the, uh, in all of the four, 42 times. If you're also obese, 69 times. If you also are stressed out, it goes 130 times. So might as well put pine, you know, pine box by bedside. So you know, things sort of add up uh, uh, that what, way. What is the, uh, the APOB? A? APO B is LDL, oh, yeah. and uh, APO A is HDL. So in this study, because people were not fasting, uh, they actually just measure, uh, they did not calculate. So when you go and you get that traditional thing up on top, the LDL cholesterol is calculated. In here, they measure it. And they measure it as APOB, which is really the real way of measuring LDL. And they measure APOA, which is another way of, not so good way of measuring HDL, but uh, as I. Now, this slide shows you can go the other way. If you don't smoke, your risk goes down 65%. If you eat fruits and vegetables, it goes down 30%. Your exercise goes down 14%. You have a little bit of alcohol, 9%. You actually don't smoke any fruits and vegetables, goes down uh, 76%. You actually, uh, you add exercise to that, it goes down 79%. You have a little vino to that, 81%. So, I mean, you can go one way, and you can go the other way. And if you take Lipitor, it goes down 30% only. So, you know, I mean, there is great power to sort of uh, a lifestyle, you know, a lifestyle routine. Now, to show, you know, to sort of demonstrate that again, uh, there were two studies uh, about 10, uh, 10 years ago, uh, actually 11 years ago now, 12 years ago, looking at the prevention for diabetes and physical activities for individuals who were are predisposed to getting diabetes. They randomized 3,000 people. They separated them into three groups. Placebo, metformin, a drug that sort of makes you more sensitive to your own insulin, and exercise and diet. The exercise and diet group had a 58% reduction in heart and diabetes over a 2.8 year uh, period. Very impressive. Uh, they actually, it was a five year study. They had to stop the study after three years because it was unethical to tell the people who were taking metformin and who were taking, uh, who were taking the sugar pill that exercise and uh, diet was good for them. So they had to stop the study and tell them that exercise was good for them. So they had to stop uh, for that reason. Now, this is the only slide we'll be uh, talking about smoking. Smoking is really bad for you. Um, we talked about those 12 years, but if you have a family history of heart disease and you smoke, you actually decrease your life expectancy by 15 years. 
So that's sort of right off the bat. Uh, you die sooner, there's more money for us for, you know, for Social Security later on. Um, now, um, how about sort of changing your lifestyle in midlife? Um, uh, about, um, that was a study actually that was published in the Archives of Inter Internal Medicine. I think it's really important because so, you know, it is possible that you can say, gee, you know, um, things are sort of, uh, you're done. In midlife, uh, there's nothing you can do if you have lived poorly. So they actually looked at 16,000 participants, uh, and what they found, they looked for four factors. Uh, eating fruits and vegetables, regular exercise, having a, a BMI that did not put you in the obese group, and not smoking. And what they found was that in this population, in this country, about 8.5% of the population met those four criteria. The same is true in Europe. This has been repli replicated in... It's on the wrong mode. Actually, uh, no, yeah, it's on the wrong mode. What is that? Um, well, you know, as I say, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> So I'm actually going to sort of, uh, let's see how it goes. Yeah, we're, we're cool. So, um, so what they found was that they were able to counsel individuals. And after six years, 8.4% actually did change their behavior to meet those four criteria. And what happened is that those who switch to a healthy lifestyle experienced a 40% reduction in all post mortality risk and a 35% risk reduction in cardiovascular events over the next four years. So that's very, very impressive. You actually can decrease your mortality rate by 40% versus those who did not meet those four criteria. Uh, and so there is actually a benefit of sort of changing in midlife. Now this is where we actually did the first study, uh, and this was published in 1953 in the Lancet. So uh, as you know, this is a double-decker. The double-decker has two civil employees. The guy who drives and the guy who's the conductor. I don't know what they call it, conductor. There's no orchestra, but the, con the conductor goes up and down, and down a staircase to pick up the tickets. And uh, so they have same sort of salary, same work environment. Uh, conductors are a little bit uh, more stressed out because they're sort of dealing with people uh, and try to sort of uh, you know, pick, you know, get their tickets. Uh, but what they found was that the drivers had a significantly higher incidence of cardiovascular events than the conductors. And if they had a cardiac event, the drivers had twofold the mortality than the conductors who were more physically active. And this is actually the first study demonstrating the health benefits of physical activity. That study was then replicated in the USA, again in Oakland, in the port of Oakland, in the days that people who were unloading chips had to do physical activity. Now they sit on a machine and they, no one is moving. But they actually found that those guys who were really burning a lot of energy, you know, calories at work were actually had sort of the same kind of, same kind of data. Now we cannot do studies at work because nobody is physically active at work for the most part. So this is actually another study looking at the level of fitness and uh, mortality. So this was actually a study that was done at the, at the Cooper Clinic, and uh, they actually uh, did an exercise stress test, a Bruce Protocol exercise stress test on about 10,000 men. And uh, what they found was that uh, they were able to separate people. They did uh, two exercise stress tests five years apart. And if people were unfit on the first, uh, unfit on the first, and unfit on the second stress test, they were compared with people who were unfit and then fit, and people who were fit on both, uh, uh, on both uh, exercise stress tests. And actually, this is actually the mortality rate. The people who actually were the fittest on both exercise stress tests lived the best at the least mortality rate. People who were unfit and then became fit had a significant uh, drop in uh, 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 mortality. And people who were unfit uh, and uh, unfit in the second actually had the highest uh, mortality. That's been also been replicated for uh, women. So this is actually the conclusion that they came from this study, and that is for each one minute that their subjects <coughs> increase on a Bruce Protocol treadmill test, 
they enhance their longevity by 8%. So if you have an exercise stress test today, and you come back and, and you do an exercise stress test two, five years later, and you exercise longer five years later, what that means is that there has been no biologic aging, and that at five years later you're expected to live longer than you actually were expected to live five years before. And that is actually great power of exercise as medication. From the Harvard study that was not quoted over here, uh, and looking at about a thousand kilocalories uh, of increased activity or metabolic units, uh, that actually increases your, uh, decreases your mortality rate by 20% per 1,000 calories that you burn per week in exercise. So if you're actually burning 2,000 extra calories, then that decreases your mortality rate by 40%. And that effect is greater the older you are. So when you're exercising at 20, you're just sort of practicing them so that when you're at 75, you can exercise and gain the benefit. And the benefit is better and better the older that you get. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, it's more powerful than any pill or any intervention I can do on anyone. So then the next question is, what is better, to be fit or and fat or to be skinny and unfit? And, and, unfit? and this actually was also uh, uh, shown in this slide here. So you have a group that people who are obese and fit versus unfit. Overweight, that is a BMI between 25 and 30. Uh, uh, unfit and, uh, and unfit. And individuals who are normal weight, unfit and, uh, and actually uh, fit. And you can see that in, at any weight, there was a longevity benefit uh, in, uh, versus, uh, of fitness versus being unfit at any weight. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to pay attention to what to do for your New Year's resolution, actually, I think it's very difficult to lose weight. Most people uh, can be on a diet only for about uh, 12 weeks, and after 12 weeks they, they, they break their diet. But it's actually much easier to get fit. Uh, so at the South Asian Heart Center, uh, we do not manage weight. We do not prescribe Weight, uh, weight reduction programs. We prescribe a fitness program. Uh, and that fitness program goes beyond being able to do a push-up. We're talking about all around fitness. And we'll, uh, uh, so that actually, if we define fitness as the capacity of the individual to rise to a challenge, both either psychological or physiological. That is, you could be, you know, you could be completely chiseled, but if you don't have the psychology, you may not be able to hide that mouth. So it's both both psychological and also physiological. That's what we're paying attention. You had a question? Yeah, <clears throat> I've seen lots of slides about the benefits of exercise. But well, what is the underlying physiological change that exercise brings? Do you have some uh, some printouts we can study later or some? Slides? Yes, actually, you know, there's. There is a talk itself, just in the physiology of exercise, but since we're trying to get everything here today, but you can actually get that talk online at southasianheartcenter.org, and you will get that talk either as a video or as a PDF uh, file. And now that you have gotten accustomed to my funny accent, you'll be able to understand it on, on the video. But uh, there are multiple factors that go beyond the cholesterol. And this is actually really, because people, you know, we like numbers, so oh, look at the numbers, so you're doing exercise to change that number. But most of the health benefit of exercise is not on the uh, LDL cholesterol or HDL cholesterol. In fact, LDL cholesterol for the most part does not respond to exercise, does not respond to weight loss. So people say, oh, you have high cholesterol, you have to you know, weight, you know, lose weight on exercise. Doesn't affect that number, but it does affect inflammatory markers, endothelial function, platelet function, well-being, affects the CPU, better sleep, better digestion. So all the things can be actually explained by, you know, are the health benefits of exercise that just be, goes beyond one thing. Uh, but you can actually, uh, you can sort of get an idea uh, by, by, going, uh, by going to those talks. Now you had another, you had a question there? Yeah, uh, you mentioned about uh, as you grow older, the effect of exercise is more. But mm -hmm. are the benefit, because yeah. as you grow yeah, older, benefit, you have yeah. a higher risk of dying, so that okay. you can see it. So if you have a low <laughs> risk of dying when you're 20, then it's difficult to show a benefit. 
Okay, but are there some studies which actually show that if somebody had started more physical activity at an earlier age, like for example, if somebody started at the age of 30 as compared to age of 50, what is the advantage of the starting at 30? Yeah, I know. Actually, physical fitness in your teenage years significantly decreases your risk of cardiovascular disease in your adult years. Just like physical fitness in your younger years increases your success in business at a later years, or your success in school. Yeah, I mean, as a common sense, I can, I, can, yeah. I think that it will be true, but I don't that's want to exactly. adopt yeah, that's, it. You got it, that's okay. exactly how uh, that is, that is, so there are multiple papers now, most recently this year, showing that, again, that uh, uh, being physically fit as a teenager predisposes you to have less heart disease as a grown up. So, Dr. Bovega, yeah. uh, I have a question now on exercise, something which I recently learned, so yeah. I might I just ask you as well. Uh, that uh, most of us think that we do 30, 40 minutes of treadmill or exercise in a day. Uh, that is good. What I recently yeah. learned is that's not good because if you do 30, 40 minutes of one brisk exercise in a day and rest of the time you are sitting and you're sedentary, that is bad because every half an hour you're supposed to do your body is designed to kind of move. Can you yes, can we elaborate on that? Uh, uh, actually, uh, let me see if I, I don't have a slide on that, but it's also on that slide uh, on that. Uh, so the good news is that you cut your risk of cardiovascular disease by over 50% by, you know, by being physically active. The bad news is you cut in half that benefit by sitting in front of a computer or a monitor by 100, more than 180 hours per day. So if you have... 180 see, minutes. 180 minutes, sorry, I apologize. <laughs> I was trying to Someone do is awake. Um, 180 minutes per day. So um, that's, so what you do is you send, up, you, know, you send an email, then you walk up to the other person saying, I just sent you an email. Uh, people used to hang around the photocopy machine. I don't think that we photocopy that much anymore. But you know, there's still the water fountain. And, uh, so you just have to get up. You know, I, I, it works a little standing, move around. Uh, I, I don't see why you cannot have a walk and talk meeting rather than a sit down meeting. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I think that uh, you know, if you have the opportunity to sort of control your meeting times, and a lot of people in this valley, I mean, start their day sitting in a meeting. Uh, I would. Uh, where for Cisco is on your iPhone, but I mean, you could be walking on your iPhone uh, and, and having uh, uh, your meeting uh, that way, or you know, even at the golf course having your meeting that way. So. Um, that is really a very, you know, very good point. So the, the, the other thing is, when is the best time to exercise? And uh, these actually studies have been shown looking at the physiologic response, the endocrine response, metabolic response to a high-fat meal, and actually uh, physical activity. And uh, the bottom line is that you have a better HDL and triglyceride response 8 to 12 hours after exercise than um, uh, than soon after exercise or before um, or, or eating um, uh, after exercise, uh, before exercise. So um, that's actually the bottom line there is um, it's best to exercise about eight hours be be before your biggest meal of the day. So most of the time the biggest meal of the day is in the evening. So I would definitely um, you know, exercise in the morning and then life takes care of itself. The thing about it is that the other benefit of exercising early in the morning is that no meeting, nothing gets in the way. You get it done, it's out of the way. What happens is people wait until the end of the day, they're tired, they get in the traffic, they have this and that, and then they don't make it, you know, they don't exercise. The last thing is that home-based exercise programs are more successful than gym-based exercise programs. Uh, and that sort of tends to be sort of obvious. Uh, and I have a slide of, you know, someone sort of uh, fish uh, paying pebbles to another fish. Said, hey, you know, I give you these pebbles and the only thing we do is we go around, swim around it. Uh, so, uh, the, in the tank. So, uh, if you develop a home-based exercise program, the other also benefit is your children will see you exercise. And that is the best motivator to create kids who also are physically fit. And there's a side effect to that, and that's also part of the talk, you see the data, and that is, Children who are physically fit, the top uh, quartile fitness uh, kids in school are also in the top academic performance in school. So, um, and you know, if you 
are concerned about the edu so educational cognitive capacity of your children. Actually, that's another way of enhancing the chances of your children, not only to prevent them heart disease uh, uh, in their 40s and 50s, but also to improve their cognitive capacity. In fact, you do better for IQ by doing push-ups and running than by studying a class in history or, or chemistry or whatever. And it's actually, uh, you know, that is sort of, that's what the data shows. Uh, now, it is also sometimes very difficult to exercise. Some people just sort of are allergic to it. Uh, so the best thing to do, and this actually comes from Canada, is to buy a dog. I would recommend a terrier because they drive you crazy if you don't take them for a walk. Uh, and most, of the, most people who are dog owners actually tend to meet the criteria recommended 150 minutes per week uh, of exercise. Uh, and that uh, uh, is sort of what this Canadian study uh, uh, showed. So we are now, also now going to move on to uh, the diner versus the dinner. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can think about uh, your car. You, know, you would not put you know, bad gasoline into your car. Uh, you would not put in, you know, you, you make sure that you pay attention, change to your oil, you put high quality oil into your car. And the same should be true for, you know, or, or fuel. Uh, there's really no magic diet. You know, you always see all those promises uh, walking out of, uh, of Safeway on the side here, you know, the latest diet. You know, people before and after. Uh, but uh, that before and after then has another after, which just sort of goes away. Uh, and. Uh, you know, we, uh, we, we also have to think about, uh, the bottom line is, what I tell my patients is, just eat like at the time of RAM. So if you, you know, forget everything, everything here, just, you know, if you have a high quality meal that actually is a dairy-based uh, diet rather than a, a sugar, carbohydrate-based diet, you're better off. In the times of RAM, there was no homogenization. So milk would have cream up on top, that cream would go to ghee. Ghee was used for cooking, medicine, and fuel, you know, with the ghee candles um, that are still in use. Uh, and then the rest was pure protein. There was no fat there. And that goes into paneer, which you should be able to make at home. Uh, cottage cheese and yogurt, high protein meals that actually are very low in sugar because the bugs have already eaten the sugar and left you with the yogurt and the cottage cheese. So you're having a high protein, low carbohydrate, low fat meal that way, rather than eating a grain-based uh, vegetarian uh, diet. There is this epidemic of diabetes in, in India, it's thought to be due to uh, you know, very high white rice, very large white rice consumption. I come from Puerto Rico, who have, they also have rice for lunch and dinner. Uh, and they actually have the highest incidence of diabetes in the USA. Okay. So we're eating our ways to the grave. Uh, we are actually surrounded by weapons of mass expansion. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, the growth of the fast food industry has been stratospheric. Uh, and uh, they just eat, you know, next to each other. 60% of Americans are overweight and growing. Uh, and uh, there are many factors for that obesity. Uh, soft drink consumption is associated with significant risk of diabetes. If you have one soft drink per day, that is seven soft drinks per week, uh, you have an increased risk of diabetes that is twofold that of someone who does not drink soda. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, soda consumption is one of the no-no's uh, of recommendations from the South Asian Health The thing is that that is also true if your soda is even diet soda. So diet soda as well as regular soda is really bad for you. If you're a woman and you have cola, that also increases your risk of uh, osteoporosis. The number of meals have something to do. If you have fewer than three meals per day, you have a higher risk of being obese than if you have three or more meals per day. Mm -hmm. Skipping breakfast is associated with a fourfold higher risk of, the, of, of being obese. Uh, so it may just be a skipping breakfast because you had a very big, large dinner uh, and you may not be hungry that morning. Or you, because you're skipping breakfast by lunch, your metabolism sort of changes so that you become insulin resistant. So you're becoming more like a, someone who's sort of predisposed uh, for diabetes. So breakfast is actually an important meal of the day. <coughs> eating at home is associated with less incidence of obesity than eating outside, uh, outside the home. How about nuts and chocolates? Uh, nut consumption. Uh, 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 
quarter cup of walnuts per day, uh, particularly your Spanish, is associated with a 30% reduction in the risk of stroke. Two tablespoons of extra olive oil in your diet per day is associated with a 40% reduction in the incidence of diabetes. And the uh, addition of dark chocolate in your diet is associated with decreased risk of hypertension, stroke, and congestive heart failure. So the better way to do it is you go, uh, you go and get some dark chocolate covered almonds. You have four to six of those. Uh, they're about, uh, uh, about three of them are about 90 calories. Uh, so that's not bad. And then you have regular nuts, uh, uh, the, other, the other six nuts that are not dark chocolate covered. So ultimately you have about 12 nuts per day. And you know, you should have them under your desk. So that little snack you want to have, instead of having a soda, take it out. Put out your nuts out there like a pill and enjoy. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I thought caffeine can affect your brain cells. So is there a replacement for that dark chocolate? Caffeine? That's what yeah, I caffeine is actually really good for your brain cells. Your brain cells really like it. Now I'm biased, I come, you know, I come from the, a place where that makes a great coffee. But uh, actually, coffee consumption is associated with enhanced longevity, decreased lung cancer in smokers, and it's also um, associated with less atrial fibrillation and hypertension. So um, uh, I haven't seen any other data otherwise. Now, caffeine consumption can increase your er chances of error in a test, and ca uh, caffeine consumption, if it leads to dehydration, can decrease your aerobic capacity. So, you know, having a, a, you know, one of those Red Bulls have all kinds of chemicals and caffeine in it, and people do it before going to the gym, they think that they, they feel that they're getting stronger, <laughs> but they may have decreased uh, aerobic capacity because if they get the volume depleted, they're able to run less. So if you have your, one of those things, you need to have a, you know, big, huge glass of water with it, and I have a bathroom nearby. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, how, about, how about tea? Uh, tea drinkers also live longer than non-tea drinkers. So there are very few things that you can put in your mouth that are good for you. Everything else has been shown to increase your risk of diabetes. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, coffee and tea, I guess, are okay. But, uh, but if you're, but if you're uh, uh, putting uh, a lot of milk and a couple of spoons of sugar yeah. in a cup of tea and having it three times a day, is that... And that may be, actually... Because that's how, that's how most question. people drink tea, I think, in, in our community. Another disclaimer. If you're a smoker Same and you're having coffee. coffee, that coffee will protect you from having a little bit of protection from lung cancer if you don't add milk to it. If you add milk to that coffee and you have your cigarette, that coffee will not be protected. I don't know why, but that's what the data shows. Now, uh, going back to sugar, and this is actually, I mean, I may, I mean, I may be kicked out of the church, but a teaspoon of sugar only has 25 calories. So believe it or not, that teaspoon of sugar is not the bomber. It's not the poison. The poison is that the typical American has 22 extra teaspoons of sugar per day. The typical high school student has 34. And that is making him soda. So, you know, Cause, cause forget it's about that teaspoon of sugar and that tea. That Coca-Cola has a gazillion ones. Yeah. So, it's true. I mean, if you're having coffee or tea all day, you're having Cremora, which is actually, you know, I mean, which is like, poison. you see, you know, it's palm, you know, uh, all these tropical oils that have been sort of further hydrogenated that make into those fake, fake milk. You know, might as well actually pine box by bedside. But if you're, you know, having a little bit of, you know, non-fat milk, uh, and uh, boiled milk with a chai and one teaspoon of sugar, I don't think that's going to be that bad. Uh, but if you're, you know, if you're a Cuban and you do like this, sh the sugar into, you know, then <laughs> that may be bad. Go ahead. So, you, in nuts, everybody talks about walnuts. Is the, is well, the walnuts that, because that, that was just the one, the American Walnut Association, California Walnut Association donated the walnuts to the Spanish study that was published in New England Journal last year. Yeah. But if it's any act because of capitalism, every nut growing association has sponsored studies <laughs> showing that their want that their nuts are good for them. <laughs> so in, in Ayurveda, I, you know, you're supposed to start the morning with nine to twelve soak peeled nut, uh, almonds every morning, which we are thought to be very uh, shazadic. But anyhow, you were saying. But so. you talk. Uh, so, but so almonds, as I was going to say, nuts are all nuts is okay. But then cashews are supposed to have some mixed. 
excessive amount of fat? No, actually cashews for reasons that are unclear to me have a bad reputation. Cashews actually, they may have a bad reputation because they're new world nuts rather than old world nuts. Uh, they actually come from Brazil. Uh, but you know, some of the best uh, cashews are now grown in India. You know, super duper uh, cashews. And the thing is that cashews have to be processed because they're actually poisonous. You know, varnish uh, is actually made of cashews. Uh, so, um, so they have to, so you have to remove the varnish from the cashew, uh, but uh, uh, not from the, the, the nut itself, the, you know, the cover. So, but what, uh, cashews are fine, they actually have less saturated, you know, they have less fat than some of the other, mm -hmm. of the other nuts, but I, I don't know why they have a bad reputation but that they have. Yeah. Pistachios also, actually, believe it or not, pistachios are good for you too. Sure. How about salted mm -hmm. nuts? Well, this is another issue for the salt. And I, you know, most of the data that I have seen has not been with salted nuts. And salt, a lot of higher salt consumption is associated with a higher incidence of hypertension. <coughs> the recommended salt <coughs> amount that is sort of recommended by the American Heart Association and everybody else is not followed by anywhere <coughs> in the world. Uh, and Yasuf, who did the Interheart trial, also looked at that. And no one eats two, two grams of salt per day ever anywhere in the world, but that's what we recommend. So you just have to sort of be, you know, cautious and avoid having excessive salt. Now, you're playing tennis all day, you know, it's okay to have some salt and peanuts, uh, but if you're watching TV and watching the games all day, then it may not be uh, such a good idea. Uh, so it just depends, you know, salt, you know, humans can sort of regulate their salt intake, also, our taste buds get sort of a costume to too much salt, uh, so you have to be cautious about that. But there is really no need to be a good chef. You don't need to put a lot of salt to be a great chef, and if you do, then you're not a great chef. Uh, now, uh, lastly, about uh, fiber. And uh, take home message is highest fiber intake versus lowest fiber intake, 60% reduction in mm -hmm. diabetes. Yeah. Nature, and our, we have evolved with our food. That's the way it has been. You know, sad news for the people into, the gene in, uh, into sort of gen genetically modified food. We have evolved that way. And our food, uh, or grains that we have traditionally consumed, have an outer layer. That outer layer has amylase inhibitor <coughs> to help us modulate the sugar flow into our system. So we have evolved with the wheat, we have evolved with our rice, with all our nuts, so that we have actually, we have found them to be life promoting. So they actually say, hey, we become life promoting for humans, we'll continue to grow and you know, survive you know, the droughts and everything else. So it has been advantageous to their grains, advantageous to humanity. So, but they had this sort of covering outside that sort of has an amylase inhibitor, so or saliva, you remember from biology in high school, has amylase, which starts digesting the starch in our food. <coughs> our pancreatic juices have amylase to help us digest the starch in our food. And the grain, the fiber, has an amylase inhibitor that modulates so that we don't get a sugar rush that is actually not health promoting. And the sugar rush is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. You can talk about, you can read about it in the diner versus the dinner web, you know, uh, web uh, uh, link in our website. Um, and uh, uh, if you take it out, then now the problem is that the cereal industry takes it out, sells it to you up front, and then adds sugar to it. Yeah. And doesn't add starch, it actually adds sugar that doesn't meet the amylase. So you have to be careful by having the brand that has sugar added to it. You just have to have the uh, brown rice and the brown wheat and the uh, unprocessed, uh, unprocessed grains. On a smaller amount of them. You had a question. So, if someone's pre-diabetic, as there's so many people, you know, in the U.S., um, and they eat a lot of uh, uh, vegetables, yes, but also fruits, which obviously have fructose. Exactly. Um, you talked about, you know, 60% reduction in uh, if you eat a, you know, a lot of fiber. Is that is it still beneficial for them to have some whole fruits because it's still coming with. Uh, you know, the whole fruit and all the phytonutrients yeah. and everything? Actually, there is some benefit of eating fruit, uh, but not all fruit are the same. 
right. uh, and also increased fruit intake is associated with increased risk of diabetes. More than four servings of fruit per day is associated with an increased risk of diabetes. So, you know, it's actually a source of fructose. Now, and I think we discussed this, you know, uh, a nice, you know, you can have a banana, white, carbohydrate, full of starch, not sweet, as you know. Or you can have a blueberry, raspberry, very sweet, perfect, pineapple, even better, you know, great, very sweet, very little sugar, because it has no starch. Watermelon, very sweet, minimal amount of carbohydrate, just has a little sugar and no, and no starch. So you can think that the enemy to be the starch. Uh, more than anything else, but uh, and uh, so you want to avoid starchy fruits and to have more sort of sort of sweet, uh, multicolored fruit like blueberries. A cup of blueberries has only 60 calories, 60 to 90 calories, which is I mean, and a cup of blueberries, a lot of blueberries, you know. Uh, so that's what I would recommend more than having bananas and, and other stuff. Yeah. When you talk about starch, I mean potatoes are bad. So potatoes are full of starch. Yeah, are very starchy now. White potatoes are very starchy. Uh, a yellow potato uh, has very little, actually has very little starch. It's sweet. Sweet potato is very sweet. So it has less starch, and you don't get the same metabolic uh, cost to having a sweet potato versus a uh, white potato. So what, um, take home message is have multicolored food and avoid white food. Um, Dr. Molina, so the, what's a good way to find out what food is is it look at the glycemic index of the thing? Is it well, I mean, you can, you know, you can look at the glycemic index or just sort of, you know, uh, I would, you know, I don't know of any human that consistently reads and follows sort of like all those sort of labels. In fact, yeah. I prefer that if he has a label, don't eat it, particularly if you can't pronounce it. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, um, but um, um, my suggestion is uh, two fists of uh, vegetables, one fist of fruit per day, well, not daily, and whatever is left after you eat all that, then you know either if you want to have a little protein and grain, that's cool, that's fine. Bread, you know, a little bit of that, you know, just having a good time. Yeah, you know, every meal should be a celebration, and it should be just fun and dandy. I so mean, what if you what if you mix vegetables and fruit and make a juice out of it and then drink that? Well, then you, what happens is you have a lot of stuff in a little bit. Yeah. So then you're actually exposing yourself to a lot of, too much stuff. So, you know, in cha chapter six of the Gita says, you know, moderation of food too is very important for developing fitness. So enlightenment is the finest fitness in the Gita. And we talk about fitness here differently, but it's all the same fitness. And moderation there, and actually you're having too much food and too many vegetables, you know, too much fruit. Like, you get a smoothie, you add a banana, you add a cup of blueberries, then you add some kale, then you add this and that, and then you add some yogurt. By the time you have this little big drink like that, and you have, you know, consume about 600 calories of sugar. Thinking you're having a nice sort of, uh, you know, the, the worst thing is Jamba juice. I mean, I don't know if they still, you know, have them around, but. It's like you think you're hell out protein this and wheatgrass there and <laughs> think 800 calories later, you know, yeah. uh, you know, sort of. Uh, so what about the processed juices? So, so I think that so that actually the, the good good question and that is, we recommend to avoid drinking liquid calories except for milk and a little bit of wine or beer or whatever. But so uh, so avoid drinking your calories. It's best to eat your calories now. If you want to one day sit down and have a glass of pomegranate juice, you know, it's okay. Now, to have a glass of pomegranate juice, I'm no American. When we were growing up, I grabbed, you went to a restaurant, they gave you a glass of orange juice. It was this little, you know, thing like that. It was like a shot, you know, <laughs> you clear your palate. But go to a restaurant and ask for a glass of orange juice yeah. or pomegranate juice. But, so, if you, but if you uh, have a small smoothie, which is more vegetables uh, accented with some fruits to give it flavor, uh, I'm just asking, wouldn't it also have a lot of the fiber, uh, but still a lot of good stuff? Because vegetables are great. Uh, and you add a little bit of fruit, and you're still getting all the fiber. Yeah. Right? That would be fine. Yeah. That's super. You know, the thing is, is you know, I don't know of any American who has a little of anything, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they will, will You know, it's actually, actually, 
it's sort of like we talk about the Europeans have only about 8.4% of them meet the same criteria. The difference is Americans smoke less, but they're fatter. Europeans smoke more, and they're less fat. So, I mean, you get on an airplane, they put a blindfold, and then you can, by that sort of landing on the airport, you, can, you know where you are. Yeah. Yeah. USA yeah. versus Europe or China or India. I mean, it's like, it's just the way, it's just the way it is. Go ahead. I have two questions. One, Go ahead. Um, do you recommend paying attention to soluble versus insoluble fiber? Yes. Uh, and two, when you exercise, you lose potassium, uh, rigorous exercise. Yeah. So is it worth drinking raw coconut water or something like that that actually gives you uh, potassium in liquid calories? So uh, I want to answer the question on potassium. Uh, potassium is the most common uh, electrolyte in cells. So the cells, the intracellular space is actually potassium rich. Sodium poor and potassium chloride rich. And, you know, when we have an action potential, is exchanged between those two. So, and this is actually, please don't quote me, there is actually more potassium in a steak than in a glass of orange juice. <coughs> because there are more cells, I mean. So, uh, and, but we, you know, <coughs> the Floridians have, you know, are selling orange juice on the basis of the benefits of potassium. Um, so, we actually have, po increased potassium in our diet is associated with decreased incidence of hypertension. Not a question of that. Now, the thing is, is potassium supplementation the same thing as increased potassium in your diet? And the answer is probably not. So, you know, adequate potassium is actually easy on the American, you know, in any diet, because most of our food is potassium rich. Now, very few people have to supplement their electrolytes from exercise. There are some a small minority of people who have autonomic dysautonomia, who actually have either Parkinson's disease and have child drivers and they stand up and they faint, or have pus, they stand up and they become hypotensive and they get a tachycardia, or they have neurocardiogenic syncope. Those people may have to supplement themselves with electrolytes. But for the most part, there's no need to have any excess. <coughs> you know, Gatorade is, a, I mean, it's a, you know, it's crazy. but. You know, they sort of always sort of get the winning coach sort of stuck with it, but uh, it's really of no, no true, no true benefit. And they have also, you know, looked at, you know, what is best to consume your calories while you're exercising or after exercise. And there was actually greater weight loss in people who consume their calories after exercise than during exercise, like a, a la Gatorade or drinking a juice, or what they're having. So I, I cannot give you a recommendation to have coconut or you know juice or or whatever. Uh, you know, it's a laxative. Uh, also, you have to be a little careful. You're drinking coconut juice and go for a run. So, you know, stuff, you know, stuff like that. Uh, you know, Jogananda had a nice coconut juice before he had his heart attack. Before he gave his stuff. Remember you? The, uh, I'll go right here of a jogi. Go ahead. Maybe you already spoke about alcohol. Is there any data based on some studies not sponsored by the alcohol industry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that you can you know, actually, I have to tell you a story. I used to give talks about the health benefits of alcohol. And I, I actually used to have, but the disclaimer is, my family is in, was had been in the alcohol industry. And I actually was a co-owner of a winery. So that's a disclaimer. However, you know, as I was giving my talks about the health benefits of alcohol, I then, you know, I, I, I asked my patients who are 90 years old how much they drink. Rarely have I met a 90 plus year old patient who drinks. That's just just the bottom line. I mean, I I never I've never met you know 90 plus year old people you know who are drinkers. Mm -hmm. And the health benefits of alcohol is actually uh, it's sort of interesting. You get a benefit of two drinks per day, and then after that your benefit disappears. And that's mainly for men. There's no real health benefit for women from alcohol because every drink increases your risk of breast cancer by 8%. So, you know, the French paradox is not because of the wine. The French part, because the Scots drink more alcohol, more wine than the French. Uh, if you see Masterpiece Theater, they're always drunk. And, you know, drinking, uh, and they, it's so, um, so it's not the alcohol. Um, uh, it, it actually, there are other factors. Uh, and like Northern Europeans, like the Scots, share some of the genetics that the 
the salvation share, the alpha little a that increases our risk of coronary artery disease there too. So, uh, but does alcohol, you know, alcohol is part of our culture, you know, it tastes good. I tell my patients that it's safer to have a, a Budweiser than a Pepsi. Uh, and I believe. Uh, you know, so I, it is, you know, uh, I actually, uh, that sort of, I actually had to sell all my stock on Coca-Cola and Pepsi because what yeah. I lecture about now. But um, let me talk a little bit about stress. And uh, this is actually a nice way of sort of defining stress. We don't know what stress is. You know, but there are so many definitions, but it's usually, uh, there, it's, you know, we get stressed when we are unable to sort of meet or keep up with our demands, either physiologic demands or uh, environmental demands. And that may just be because we do not have a culture physiology or because we do not have a culture uh, um, consciousness or education. So we actually uh, define um, uh, stress uh, by the inability uh, to maintain homeostasis from the physiology point of view, uh, to maintain steady state. You know, in the Gita it is said that the enlightened man is a person of steady intellect. So this issue of homeostasis is always present either in biology, in chemistry we call it a steady state, in physics we call it entropy, and in the, in the Gita, we call it enlightenment. So uh, that's sort of, it's, it's, it's there everywhere. Um, so that's for physiology. Um, and then for psychological stress uh, results from the inability of the individual or organization to rise to the challenge because of lack of know-how. So lack of creativity. So to avoid psychological stress, it is of, it's of benefit to have to be awake and alert and to be creative. Uh, so if you find, if you get a, a problem, then it's not a problem if you know the answer or you can figure out the answer by your creativity. And then instead of a stress, it's a joy. So, you know, people say stress versus distress versus you stress. It's only you stress when you can actually, you know, meet the challenge and, and or, you know, survive and, and over, overcome the challenge. And that's actually not stress. That is actually being creative, intelligent. So there is great benefit to intelligence, creativity, and education. So um, in that respect, we're going to talk about rest. We're going to talk about rest while asleep. Remember that in the Se Alameda 7, they talk about seven to eight <coughs> hours of sleep. And we're going to talk about rest while awake, achieved through uh, meditation. We're going to talk about the different techniques. And then we're going a little bit overboard but uh, over the time, but you know, we're like from and I feel I'll cast I talk a lot. <laughs> so these are actually the six stages of sleep. Um, and uh, uh, there is actually, they're just here to, sort of to remind you that actually sleep is a dynamic process. It's actually an active process. Uh, uh, everything, uh, everything sort of sleeps. Uh, uh, and uh, it's sort of part of that, part, that rest is actually apparently very important uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the animal uh, species. The thing that you may remember, this is actually just sort of of interest. This is mainly for the guys. The first part of sleep, this transition, that one to five minutes where you're sort of falling asleep, you have these beta waves. You think you're awake. You think you're awake during those one to five minutes, but that's the time that your spouse kicks you because you're snoring and you say, I'm not sleeping, I'm awake. <laughs> so I'm sure you have sort of uh, you know, sort of experience that. Um, this is actually where you get uh, this fifth stage of sleep, is REM sleep, where you have this sort of dreaming, uh, the dreaming stage. And the interesting thing is very active in the mind, but very inactive in the physiology. So the, act, the mind is very, very active, but all the muscles are sort of paralyzed except for your rapid eye movement. You know, just, just going back and forth, going back and forth. Um, so that you can through, you know, through heaven and also fight monsters without sort of uh, killing your, your spouse next to you. <coughs> now, this is actually what is sort of happening in America and throughout most of the world. This is actually our sleep duration. Uh, in 1910, uh, the typical American slept nine hours. Uh, the BMI of the typical American was 23. Uh, by 1975, we had color TV and Johnny Carson. The typical American slept 7.5 hours, and BMI went up to 25. 
by 2005, we had the iPhone, which the typical American slept 6.8 hours, and uh, BMI went up to 27. So the less sleep we have, the fatter, you know, the fatter we get. Now, there are sort of many causes of sleep deprivation. Uh, insufficient sleep, like staying up at night, uh, watching TV, surfing the net, uh, poor fragmented sleep, carrying a beeper, getting a, you know, checking your email in the middle of the night, uh, or actually having sleep apnea. That leads to excessive daytime sleepiness, which leads to be, uh, neurobehavioral deficits, so cognitive dysfunction, performance deficits, and for our purposes, cardiometabolic problems like increased obesity, diabetes, and coronary artery disease. And, uh, that, and I will show you some of that data. So this is a, a great experiment that the Department of Commerce makes every year in the USA. So this is actually a slide showing uh, accidents. Uh, and in the orange, you see the day after the time change in the spring and in the summer, in the fall. So you can sort of see that the, this is the Monday before the time change. This is the Monday after. Losing that hour is associated with a, a two to threefold increase in accidents. That actually <coughs> continues to grow through the summer. So then by, so we're talking about, you know, 2,600. We're talking about 4,000 by the end of the summer. Then Americans get an hour back of sleep and the incidence of, of accidents starts going back down very quickly. A week after, it goes down. So, you know, thanks to our Department of Commerce, we do that experiment uh, every year. Why does it continue to go up, you think? Yeah. There's more driving. More driving? The more driving you have, the more drivers you have, the more accidents there are on the road. So, there tend to be more accidents on the road as there are more cars in the road and people do a lot of more traveling driving. In summer. In the summer than they do on, you know, that's why gas goes up in the summer. <laughs> so it's just more, just more, more, more miles on the road. That's, yeah. that's correct. Here, it's just one week after. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. just time. But, you know, because you're a bright guy, and they asked me did in the school in San Francisco, so then I had to pay attention. This is 4,000, this is 2,600. Yeah. So, but one is the summer, at the end of the summer, and the other one is, uh, uh, go ahead. Is it good to sleep in the afternoon? You know, the question is the power of napping. And that's controversial. And there is some benefit, you know, the people have demonstrated the scientific benefit to napping, but there's no benefit if you're napping because you're tired and you have sleep apnea, you need to take a nap. So it's actually a cultural <coughs> napping probably is of greater benefit than need be na napping from, from being ill. Children have different requirements. Pregnant women have different requirements. Uh, in Ayurveda, napping is not recommended. You're supposed to be awake and alert during the day, and you're supposed to be awake with the sun and asleep with the, with the you know. So I mean, that's Ayurveda. So if I don't have the scientific answer, then I'll give you this. <laughs> or I'll make it, I'll make it up. <laughs> um, you know, the thing about Ayurveda, though, is that, you know, you know things either because of time or because you do an experiment. Right. So we have never done an experiment showing that aspirin gets rid of a headache, or we all take an aspirin and gets rid of our headache without an experiment. But time has shown that aspirin is good for headache. So, um, and it's sort of funny, you know, colchicine uh, or quinine, you can buy, in the oldest you could buy quantum for muscles, but because muscle cramps, but because there was no experiment on the use of quantum for muscle cramps, you cannot buy quantum anymore. You have to buy quantum for malaria, which costs like, you know, 12 bucks a pill. <laughs> Take it for your muscle cramps, which you can buy in Canada for five bucks a, you know, 30 pills. So anyhow, that is actually the way, the way it goes. Now, let me just show you here about sleep. So in the Gita it says, yoga is for he who does not sleep or sleeps too much. So in our human physiology, this is a sweet spot, seven to eight hours. People who sleep six, less than six hours or uh, uh, inc incidence of hypertension starts to go up. Incidence particularly in women of uh, cardiovascular disease <coughs> tends to go up. People who sleep more than nine hours, incidence of diabetes and incidence of cancer goes up. So 
uh, that is actually uh, uh, this, you know the you know sweet spot. This is on average seven to eight hours is the, the you know the sweet spot. <coughs> Nine hours or more hypertension, uh, diabetes and cancer. Uh, six hours or less uh, hypertension and uh, coronary artery disease. Now, some people with sleep apnea, they sleep in less than six hours. They have fragmented sleep, and they actually also have an increased risk of diabetes. People with sleep apnea, on average, on treated sleep apnea, live seven years less than the expected uh, adult diabetes. So sleep apnea takes seven years of life expectancy. Now, how about resting while awake? Uh, they, you know, we're talking about meditation. Uh, they are actually, in 1972, a hypometabolic state was described, uh, which was sort of uh, associated with non-focused alertness or attention. So it was called restful alertness. Uh, there are uh, multiple types of meditation. There is actually uh, focus attention uh, or concentration, um, and that's very commonly seen in types of meditation such as prayer, you know, praying the rosary or uh, chanting a mantra continuously, continuously that sort of concentrative uh, 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 or focused attention. That itself has its own EEG kind of pattern. There is contemplative uh, meditation uh, where you are open monitoring either your physiology, you know, with mindfulness meditation or apana, uh, apasana meditation where you sort of open monitoring or you're uh, contemplating love and compassion and meditation that the you know, Zen Buddhists uh, uh, like to do. And then there is transcendental, where you actually, the game plan is to lose the object. So one is to focus on an object, observe an object, and the last one is to lose, um, uh, to lose the, uh, uh, the object. And uh, uh, that's sort of uh, automatic thought transcending, and uh, I think there's a typo here, in case you want to pick it up. We're not trying to lose anything off, you know, we're just losing the object. Um, so, uh, you know, I have learned that one, you know, <laughs> I have to change that one, actually. So, uh, you focus attention, you tend to have uh, sort of gamma, uh, sort of gamma waves. Uh, in open monitoring, you have sort of uh, theta waves. And in autonomic cell transcending, you have more sort of <coughs> alpha uh, waves in the EEG. Um, so, we defined uh, stress sort of physiologically and psychologically a moment ago. But this is actually uh, what we mean by this. St stress results from the inability of the physiology to maintain balance, a steady state, and or homeostasis. The psychological stress results from the absence of creativity when the individual organization is challenged. So the game plan is, you know, when you're talking about steady state, you know, you know that everything is always moving. So you just want to maintain it with minimal move, you know, so your temperature is always steady, your uh, uh, pH in your bloodstream is always steady, but there are multiple processes affecting the pH and the temperature, but you're just maintaining it steady. The moment that you're not able to maintain a steady state, then you develop hypertension. You know, your blood pressure is steady one time, and then it's all over the place, and then you have high blood pressure. Your blood sugar tends to be run in a range, then you're all over the place, and you get diabetes. So this is actually, your, you know, you're feeling well, you're up and down, feeling well, you're feeling well, feeling good, feeling tired, feeling energetic, you know, sort of that. And that actually, this is what we call this ease, where you're not at ease. Uh, so what is the effect of stress on cardiovascular health? So the inter-heart trial looked at 15,000 heart attacks and identified nine risk factors associated with an MI. Uh, and uh, what they found was a psychosocial stress uh, increases your risk of uh, cardiovascular events, heart attacks, by 2.7 times. And that it attributed to about 32% of heart attacks. So psychosocial stress has a uh, attributable uh, uh, incidence. If you took all the psychosocial stress, you would actually decrease heart attacks by about a third. Excuse me. Now this is a slide uh, that is not for me to read because it's, a, it's just very busy, but it's there for you to sort of find in the website. And these are just uh, a number of studies demonstrating the relationship between stress and cardiovascular disease, successful aging, and longevity. Do you have a question? So is there a physiological measurement for stress? <coughs> my sense is, you know, being normal, like a creative, playing, working, 
uh, has always been kind of a good health situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, when I meditate is when for some reason there is a catastrophe or sort of dramatic reason for me to get stressed. Right? Uh -huh. Either bad news or, oh, oh, or some shocking event has happened and I feel like I need to balance it for meditation. But is there kind of a normal stress, a physiological measurement, which is the healthy, normal way of being? Mm. So if there is a normal stress, or stress by definition, <coughs> or happens, but the game plan is to avoid the happening, the accumulation of stress, which means that the physiology is unable to return to steady state. So if you actually look at your skin uh, resistance, which is a nice way of measuring the your physiological of the skin stress. So you, you are presented with an obstetric stimuli. You will actually decrease the resistance because there will be increased sweat in your palm. You can have a prolonged effect where you are not going to steady state, return to steady state quickly, or you can have a quick response and also then you can turn off the response. So that second is actually a more normal, less stressed, versus the first one to just that the physiology is not able to return to homeostasis. So there is no question that you know, we are continuously affected by the three doshas, you know, creation, maintenance, and I mean, there's all these processes, all these reactions continuously going through. So the question is, can you maintain them in a steady state? Or, can you, or do they go out of balance, and then you're not a steady state. So, um, and then ultimately, you know, things sort of break down and, and the things happen, but the game plan is to avoid that and maintain that as, you know, to, to run as, as well as possible, as, as long as possible. It's like owning a car, you know, you can own a car for three years, you can have it for 15 years. You obviously want to have a nice car for 15 years, but more than, you know, only three years. So I hope that answers your, you know, that answers your, and the same is true for, psych, you know, for the psychological, you know, the psychological stress. And there are times when you can't control, you know, and lack of control is, can, you know, brings about stress, like the death in the family, disease, sometimes some things happen, you have no control. But then you learn how to sort of respond. You always respond, and then you go back to a steady state. You're, you know, someone almost runs a red light, you can be cursing that person for the next five hours, or you can just avoid the accident, just get going, and just you know have a good time and not be bothered by it. So, uh, talking about meditation, this is actually uh, 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 a picture that I took out of Scientific American that was published in 1972. Uh, and in Scientific American, this article was written after an article in the American Journal of Physiology, but American Journal of Physiology did not have pictures. And Scientific American, I bought it on eBay for 12 bucks at the picture, so I show them to you now. Uh, so what they described was a wakeful hypometabolic physiological state. Uh, and this is actually individuals who were doing transcendental meditation. Um, uh, and uh, they were 36 subjects, each serving as their own control. And what they found was that the, the, the uh, practice of transcendental meditation was associated with a drop in oxygen consumption during a 20 minute period of about 16% and a drop in CO2 elimination. So the respiratory quotient did not change, they were not holding their breath, they had a drop in metabolic rate between uh, uh, 12 to 18% uh, in the subjects who were practicing meditation for those 20 minutes. Now when you sleep, you actually have a drop in your metabolic rate about 8 to 10 percent maximum. When you do hypnosis, your metabolic rate goes up. When you do triathlon PM, your metabolic rate goes down. But the difference is here, you actually lost consciousness. You're not awake. Mm -hmm. Here, you are fully awake, but your metabolic rate goes down. So you have a state of restful alertness. And this state of restful alertness <coughs> is associated with decreased insomnia, decreased anxiety, decreased symptoms of PTSD, decreased, increased exercise capacity in people with, excess, uh, with coronary artery disease, um, decreased cholesterol and, and triglycerides, and improved insulin sensitivity in individuals who are predisposed to diabetes. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite ones. 
this is looking at biologic age. Mm -hmm. Biologic age here is determined by visual acuity, blood pressure, and HDL, um, and auditory uh, uh, acuity. And long-term medicators were biologically 12 <coughs> years younger than their, their, than their chronologic age versus controls and short-term meditators. So, uh, you know, we talked about the take-home message was 12 years, so you can add 12 years or 11 years with a meta 7, and you're biologically younger with long-term practice of meditation versus the non-practice of meditation. What is long-term is it? Why? Well, here, actually, uh, these were people who were uh, meditating for more than five, you know, five years. And these were just short-term, they were, you know, less than two years. And this was not. Also, is there any study about when to meditate? Morning, evening, or? Well, these were people night. who practiced <coughs> meditation twice a day. Oh. And but many people, are, and I'll show you a slide that shows the data of people who were not fully compliant in a moment. So this is actually uh, looking at survival. Uh, and this is actually another study done in Oakland. I, mean, I don't know why all these great studies are being done in Oakland. But they have it. That's what Berkeley is, I guess. Um, so uh, this is looking at individuals who had hypertension followed for an eight-year period. And TM is transcendental meditation associated with a drop in the blood pressure. Cardiovascular mortality was different between the control group. This is a progressive muscular relaxation and the TM group. And all-cause mortality was about 28 to 32% less in the meditation group. Now, this is a study that was published in uh, Circulation uh, a year ago. Um, and this study, actually, what they showed was that there was a 47% reduction in heart attack, stroke, um, and death in a group of meditators versus a non-meditator group with coronary artery disease. Now, the number was 61% in those who were <coughs> regular twice a day. Those were just the people who were just, you know, put into the meditation group versus the non-meditation group. So this is sort of like an a priori evaluation, but if answering your question, doing it twice a day took you from 47 to 61 percent benefit. Uh, uh, well, I was asking more of you meditate first thing in the morning or before you go to bed. Okay, is so there any such? I don't know. I don't see any. I don't know of any scientific data doing that experiment. But the the purpose of meditation is preparation for activity. Mm. So uh, so you do it before. I mean, there's no. You know. You know it. Meditation is absolutely meaningless. I mean, there's, there's as much meaning to doing a push-up of eating broccoli. Right. But you eat broccoli for a benefit, and you, med and you, you exercise for a benefit. So um, the purpose of it is that during those eight hours between the two practices, you're awake and alert, and then you maintain homeostasis better. Then the day wears off, you meditate again, and you have another eight hours of playing around, and then you go to sleep. So it's sort of, it's for preparation of acti for activity. So what is the bottom line? Uh, the bottom line is that meds, which is actually what we, our intervention, the practice of restful awareness 20 minutes twice a day is associated with enhanced longevity, fewer cardiovascular events. Exercise, regular, varied, and vigorous, um, is associated with improved cardiovascular uh, longevity, fitness, no, you know, things that go beyond your cholesterol numbers. Increased cognitive capacity. People who exercise, who do aerobic exercise, have about a 50% reduction in the, in the development of dementia, which is really significant. It's great medicine for dementia, better than anything we have. Nutrition, very simple. Two fists of vegetables, one fist of fruit. You have a fist, you can do it. 12 nuts daily, no soda, and sleep. A regular routine, seven to eight hours, you know, going to bed with the sun, rising with the sun. Go ahead. Does walking count as vigorous exercise? Well, it depends. You know, I mean, you can have, uh, you can go, you know, you can stroll or you can walk. Now, you know, I mean, these are, you know, you have a room of people. All, everybody here in this room has studied physics. And you know that the same energy is burned if you walk a mile or if you run a mile because you measure energy expenditure by distance in physics. I mean, that's what they tell me. So uh, the, pro the, the benefit is that if you run a mile, then you have more time to be active than if you just walk a mile. So uh, walking is, you know, from the cardiovascular benefit point of view, walking is acceptable form of exercise, a very good form of exercise. Um, 
Now, the question is, what is more important, amount or intensity? And if you're looking at the uh, metabolic benefits of exercise, amount is more important than ent intensity. But you also have to take into consideration that fitness is really important. And fitness is the most important predictor of successful aging and longevity. I mean, that's sort of, um, and I show you that slide from, uh, from, from, the, uh, from Blair, uh, uh, from Texas. Uh, so to be fit, you need to do a mountain, and you gain some benefit from, from being intense. Uh, because actually that you know, helps your cultures, your physiology and psychology to rise to any challenge, which is what we you know, define by fitness, how we define fitness. So, so there is great benefit to doing both amount and intensity. Now the like, next question, hey doc, how about a weekend warrior? I only exercise you know, on the weekends, uh, and not, you know, I'm too busy during the day, <coughs> during the week. Well, if you, have, if you fall into the low risk group, no hypertension, diabetes, blah, 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 you get a benefit from being a, a, a weekend warrior, but if you have fall into the higher risk group, being a weekend warrior is not a good idea. Mm. Think bad things happen in the high risk group people being a weekend warrior. So it's good to then be exercising sort of uh, regularly. So if, uh, you know, if you have a coronary artery disease, it's best to exercise regularly and you know, throughout the week than just exercising on Saturday. Did you talk about the uh, animal protein Chicken, fish, universally bad, or is it, there's some benefit to it? Well, you know, um, I just um, we eat too much protein. The requirements of protein intake are actually uh, there's no scientific data on the governmental recommendations for protein intake. Um, you know, uh, you can follow a very very low fat diet and be full of fat because you can make your own fat. You can also follow a low protein diet and be very muscular. You just have to have those essential amino acids that are not that you cannot produce. You can produce most of your 22 essential amino acids, except for about seven, four or seven. So uh, you don't need to uh, you know consume those in the diet. So we probably eat more protein than we really need. You can be a vegan and be completely chiseled. Uh, so there's no, and the other thing is that there is no relationship between protein intake and muscle, body muscle mass. So, you know, people, you know, they, they go to the gym, blah, 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 and then they go and buy their fake, you know, sort of protein powder, put it in their drink, blah, blah. Which actually, you think about it, there's as much protein in that protein powder than in a cup of cottage cheese, <laughs> and they're paying like 10 times more, and it's going through a manufacturer versus a happy cow, you know, organic. <laughs> you know, cottage cheese. So, uh, you know, but people pay high premium for that. Uh, and there's really no relationship that between protein intake and muscle mass. Uh, so you can be eating a steak, you know, every day with potato and all that kind of stuff and be like that and have not being able to sort of lift any weight. Go ahead. I was more looking at assuming moderate or modest amount of protein. It's just like historically human evolution has been a balanced diet between animal protein and vegeta yeah. vegetarian protein and all. Is there any data on uh, universal non -desi undesirability yeah. of animal well, protein? Well, actually, what happened, the, the bottom line there, actually, the, yes, there is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I only had one lecture on nutrition in medical school, and it was given by this guy, Bloom, that came from Harvard to Yale to give this talk. And he talked about the epidemiology of Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarians. And they live longer, they live about eight years longer than, non, than, their, than their non vegetarian neighbors. Uh, and um, uh, the vegetarian lifestyle is associated with enhanced longevity, but not in South Asians. But not in South Asians. Not in South Asians. Because the vegetarian diet in South Asians, you know, company excluded, doesn't contain any vegetables. So then you're not really having vegetables, you're just having grains. So um, that's, a big, you know, that's a major issue. And, you know, rice, the, the agricultural revolution, you know, was really has done, has benefited India in many ways, but also it explains a lot of the med med medical problems of India with all that white rice. Um, and that's a, you know, that is a problem. All the ancient grains have been lost in many ways. And, you know, rice tastes really good. And it 
on the main table uh, in a lot of the uh, in a lot of the population. And it's inexpensive. Uh, you know, they, they have done calculations like if they were in, to increase the tax on palm oil in India, how much coronary artery disease would be decreased. But they have problems with that because they affect the farmer. I mean, there's an economic repercussions of making food more expensive for the poor people. So, uh, uh, any other questions? So, Dr. Molina, uh, you talked about like eating and all this. Thing. What about the new medicines which are coming? I heard like there's things like you know you can have you eat whatever you want and your artery arteries block the the adreno kind of medicines which are coming and you kind of flush <laughs> your arteries and you'll be like you know back uh, back to where you are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you? So, you know, I mean, actually, I, 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 like you, I read a lot of that when I go to Safeway on the side there, you know, and they're trying to sell all the magazines. Uh, there is no pill that has made people live longer. Actually, statins, for the most part, are not, if you look at a Torva statin, it's not indicated for the reversal of arteriosclerosis. Um, and, uh, the fact is that there is no drug that we know that reverses consistently arteriosclerosis. The combination of niacin and cholesterol has been shown to, has approved for the reversal of arteriosclerosis in angiographic studies. But only there was a 16% decrease in the size of the plaque. Um, so, I, 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 you know, you know I, I think that there's great benefit. I mean, I make a little, my, my daughters are going to school, my daughter's going to school because of what I practice, my profession, but, um, and I hope to provide a service, but uh, the fact is the medications that we have have been shown to improve the quality of life of people who are ill. No question about that. But most of the medications that we use in cardiovascular medicine have been shown not to improve longevity, nor successful aging, and possibly successful aging by decreasing stroke. Uh, so the statins, the aspirins um, are great, decreases the uh, stroke and heart attack by 30. 30%. We still have 70% of those heart attacks. So, you know, everybody is trying to sort of, you know, find the miracle pill. They definitely use those languages when they're talking to investors. But uh, so far, you know, we haven't seen it. And, uh, you know, maybe it'll come up, but we'll see. And, yeah? So when you uh, talk about uh, a preventive cardiologist versus a cardiologist? So actually, only when you, you know, well, I mean, uh, you know, every physician should be involved in enhancing your health, your chest. So why do you see a doc? You either see a doc because you have a symptom you want to get rid of it, or you see a doc, so you take your car to the dealer because there's a noise and it's not working right, or you take it for maintenance, so that then you can have your car for the next 20 years. And you can also help for the kids, you know, for the uh, 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 mechanical school education for his kids. So it's good for the economy. but. Um, the same is true for a physician. If you find that your physician is helping you to achieve successful aging and, you know, uh, great life, that's a good doc. You find that you're getting, your, uh, you're seeing a, a, a dentist to take care of your cavity, that's great. Um, but it's also what you're asking for. So if you're getting what you want, that you're then, that's fine. But you may want to ask for more than just to prevent, you know, to treat your high cholesterol, you may want to sort of, sort of help you incorporate this. So the South Asian Heart Center, and you sign up for aim to, or aim to Prevent program, what it does, it helps your physician because most doctors do not provide this service. Uh, so we actually are adjuvant to what the doctors do in their office because they don't have enough time to have these conversations taking us about an hour, almost two hours to talk about this today. Uh, so the South Asian Nurse Center is there for you to so supplement the services you get at your doctor's offices. Yeah. And these slides are available on the... These are actually available <coughs> on southasianheartcenter.org. We're actually uh, in the process of making them easier to find in our website. Uh, and hopefully within the next few months they will be easier to find. We will we'll send out a link to these uh, for if you have registered and your email address is with us in that list. If you have not registered, if you just put your email address, we'll send you the, the link to this presentation. <coughs> so it's actually it's only an hour and 13 minutes. So you, know, but you don't do the 
So, um, uh, William, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. Tadi gine ko, 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 tadi